Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and this video we're breaking down Ahsoka Episode 7. The penultimate entry has just dropped, and throughout this video we're going to be going through the easter eggs, hidden details, and things you might have missed in it. We'll also be giving our theories for next time, and make sure you're subscribed and locked in so you don't miss our finale video. Now last week saw Thrawn's return with Morgan and co finally reaching Peridia. What's wild is, yeah, Dave Filoni spent six weeks building up to this to explain his reveal when, if it, if it was me, I would have just said, somehow Thrawn returned, and, and just left it at that. Great writing, that would have been, uh, but showing off his brand new night troopers and my main man Enoch, we watched as he rallied his forces together to return to the main galaxy. After giving Sabine Ezra's last location, we watched as she travelled out into the wilderness and came across some noddies before they led her to Ezra's camp. Hot on her tail were Balin and Shin, with the pair being ordered to kill them both and wipe Ezra out once and for all. We closed out with Ahsoka almost arriving, and with that recap out of the way, you should be up to speed, so sit back, look at that like button, and... Destroyed with prejudice. Now we begin back in the old galaxy at the New Republic Center, which is rocking a New Republic symbol right on the front. During Mando Season 3, we saw a similar sort of building that Carson Teva visited, which had a banner instead of it etched into it. This cements a New Republic are now fully integrated, whereas that felt more like it had been hastily thrown up. Later on, they mentioned the conflict on Mandalore, placing this firmly after the events of Mando Season 3. Now Hera has been court-martialed, and like they say, this is no longer still a rebellion. Feels a bit weird seeing Hera without goggles in live action, but hey, you know what, I kinda dig it. I also think Admiral Akbar could be there, and we get a little smirk from on Mothma due to her rebellious attitude. She herself was quite the rebel during the Ando days, and she's definitely the one out of the council that is on Hera's side. Now the debriefing's said to be like a child's fairy tale, but we of course know that the stories of Peridia were told like this to the younglings in the Jedi Temple. Lucas actually wanted Star Wars to seem like a fairy tale, which is why every movie started with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Last week played into that heavily, and it further carries forth this fairy tale aesthetic. Now, at the last second, Hera is saved by C3PO, who brings forth a data disc like the one in A New Hope with the Death Star plans on it. It's a big, big cameo, let's go, and we learn that this comes directly from Leia. Leia eventually ended up breaking off from the New Republic during the sequel trilogy, and we can kind of see the reasons why she left here. She says she sanctioned the mission to Satos, and thus Hera is allowed to go free. A huge shout outs to Simon A. Berman on Twitter for pointing out that Senator Giono is disrespectful of droids. Like many after the Clone Wars, he still had a lot of prejudice towards them, and I do kind of get the feeling that he's clearly hiding something. There are Imperial remnants located throughout the New Republic, and him shutting down the idea this quickly, it does kind of tease that he might be one. Might be a red herring, but yeah, the, the guy doesn't like them talking about that. Now, it's always nice hearing from Anthony Daniels, and we end this happy moment slightly brought down by the reality that Thrones returns on the horizon. Now, from here, we get to the title sequence and get the title Dreams and Madness. I was looking for a true meaning behind this, but unfortunately the only thing I could find was a Japanese documentary titled Kingdom of Dreams and Madness. If you know though, drop it below, but yeah, from what I can gather, it's just a generic title, though I might be making myself sound stupid here, which wouldn't be the first time. Now we cut to the Purgle moving through hyperspace and see Ahsoka on board the T6 training with a hologram of Anakin in his Clone Wars uniform. Anakin says the line from the trailer about facing more than just droids, and he then mentions the Ventress, General Grievous and Count Dooku. Ventress is another Night Sister, so maybe we will see her again in this Night Sister narrative through resurrection magic or something else. Huge shout outs to MT for realizing that Anakin tells Ahsoka to practice more than he does because he doesn't need to practice due to his high midichlorian count, and also his arrogance as well. Now Ahsoka keeps all of Anakin's recordings in a wooden box on her ship, and I actually think she might give these to Luke. Luke, of course, only really knew the character when he was Darth Vader, and though they had that moment at the end of Return of the Jedi, he's never really seen what his dad was truly like. Thus, I think handing over these holograms, it's going to give a true perspective of what Anakin was really like, and just bring Luke closer to his father. Now, you can also catch the little training droids here, one of which Luke used in A New Hope when practicing with a lightsaber on the Falcon. The shape and the design of these somewhat foreshadows the minefield, which we see later on as they exit hyperspace. Now Anakin popping up again, of course, has ties to what happened earlier in the season. 
Though it's through a different medium, it reminds Ahsoka of her visions and symbolically riffs on the lessons that she learned during the Clone Wars. I know there's back and forth still over whether this was a dream or if it actually happened, but I just don't see how she survived in the water that long and how else she would know some of the things Anakin referenced about his battle with Luke. Now her time together in the Clone Wars is very important for her to have hammered home so that she can continue to focus on the good man that he once was. Balin's very good at tapping into one's fears and through the force he's able to sense what buttons to push on someone to throw them off their game. This is something that he demonstrated perfectly with Sabine and using her emotions he was able to get her to hand over the star map. With Ahsoka as soon as she entered the area he immediately brought up Anakin which was his way of throwing her off. Anakin spoke highly of you. This is why she ended up lashing out later on and thus in the world between worlds she had to remember what he was really like. Ahsoka walking away from the Jedi Order is something she chalks up to being why Anakin changed but as we know it wasn't her fault. Thus I think this acts as a reminder of the final lesson she learned upon meeting with his ghost which is important for her to bear in mind going forward into these battles. Now Simon made a great observation and he also pointed out that the T6 has moisture on the windows. This is a great bit of attention to detail as they're obviously inside the whale and this moisture would be coming off of it and clogging up the glass. Now Hu Yang brings up the odds which C3PO of course did throughout the main trilogy but also mainly during Empire Strikes Back. Now there's more Empire references later on as we see they've entered a minefield upon exiting hyperspace. This creates an asteroid field style moment like we also got in that movie. Later on they end up hiding just like how the Falcon did inside the space slug and it all kind of brings this entire thing together. I don't know how they got so many mines out there but it's such a tense scene that throws them immediately into danger. The whales leave which loses them their cover and I don't know why Palps didn't just put, put something like this up around the Death Star or something. Now multiple fighters show up and Ahsoka flees into the graveyard rings that line the planet. Going back to the star map we actually saw a ring of Pergil around the planet on Peridia which this of course ends up representing. Now this video is sponsored by AG1, the daily health habit that's filled with vitamins, minerals and whole food sourced ingredients. So since having the twins, I've been a bit under the weather pretty much all the time because they keep going to nursery and bringing back lots of colds and viruses with them. My job's obviously very reliant on my voice and if I've got a blocked nose or a sore throat, it can make the videos sound worse than they already do. So I've been looking for ways to boost my immune system with a simple supplement that I can take once a day. That's where AG1 comes in and with just one scoop you get 75 vitamins and minerals that replenish your daily nutrients and leave you feeling better. I used to drink about 3 cups of coffee a day, now I don't even bother drinking one because it helps me feel energised until I go to bed. My immune system was also looking worse than the Emperor after some white lightning but since starting with AG1 I'm just able to focus on my work and feel a lot better. AG1 gives a comprehensive nutrition supplement that provides nutrients for body, brain and gut health. In your welcome kit you'll get an AG1 pouch, a refillable canister, AG vitamin D3 and K2, AG1 travel pack, shaker bottle and a scoop as well. It's so simple to use and it actually has like a subtle natural pineapple and vanilla flavour that I look forward to drinking every single morning. Highly recommend that you check it out, yeah just go to the link in the description, make yourself feel better throughout the day and just more energised with this daily health habit. Head to my link in the description below to get a free one year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2 plus 5 AG1 travel packs and your first purchase of AG1. That's a free one year supply of AG Vitamin D3 plus K2 plus 5 AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Thank you again to AG1 for sponsoring this video and I thank you again for everything you've done for me. Now back on the planet we see an establishing shot with 6 Night Sister statues. They're separated into groups of 3, possibly alluding to the theme of trinities that we saw in the star map room. Now the Great Mothers actually pull a lot from mythology and as we've learned more about them over the week it's become very clear what their inspirations are. The Trinity was first hinted to us with the three statues inside the tomb during episode 1 and they're clearly based on several mythological archetypes. Episode 2 is called Toil in Trouble which is a quote from the three witches that appeared in Macbeth. They're also definitely based on the Sisters of Fate from Greek mythology with them last week even bringing up the Thread of Destiny. The thread of fate has spoken to us. The thread of destiny demands it, Grand Admiral. In the legends, someone's life was represented by a thread, which was seen as a lifeline. The sisters would often cut this to kill someone, but they could also use the thread to change someone's fate. 
If you've ever played God of War 2 on the PlayStation 2, then you know Kratos was screwed over, and his entire journey was about getting to the Sisters of Fate so that he could alter the past. Upon killing them, he took his thread and pulled on it to rewind time, and aspects like this could have inspired the world between worlds. I know this was based on the wood between worlds, but yeah, lots of timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff that could have brought this across. Now, the Sisters of Fate's names are Clotho, Actropor, and Lexis, which, guess, guess what these three great mothers are also called as well? Yep, though the spellings are different, their names are actually the same, and this hammers home the idea that they're based on the Sisters of Fate. Also, shout out to Claudia Black for playing the main one. Didn't realise it was her last week because of all the makeup, but hey, good to see her back. Yeah, she's been in some brilliant stuff, and yeah, always enjoy seeing her pop up and stuff. Now inside, we see Thrawn continuing to mount up and get a hologram message from Enoch. These holograms appear slightly differently, with it being conjured through Night Sister technology, so it looks different to how the usual ones appear. As Thrawn enters, we sort of see it forming from the ceiling, and though it whizzes by, it's such a cool visual. Now Enoch is somewhat becoming a stand-in for Rook, and it's possible they could take things in the same way that they did in the original Legends run, in that Thrawn was actually betrayed by his bodyguard Rook, who ended up stabbing him in the back whilst he commanded the Chimera. Not to be like, I think about the Roman Empire once a day, but I did think at the time that this was similar to several emperors who were betrayed by their bodyguards. Star Wars has heavy Roman Empire influences, and even the Praetorian gods that we've encountered pull directly from the days of old. Those were known as the Emperor's bodyguards, but they were also notorious for betraying their bosses and assassinating them themselves. And I'm not sure if they'll go that way with Enoch or not, but his mask is clearly based on gladiatorial ones. The Night Troopers themselves could also be in line with the Ninth Legion, which our editor Matt pointed out when we were working on our follow-up theory video. The Ninth Legion was one of the most notorious Roman forces, but they completely disappeared off the records after 108 AD. What happened is had historians battle for centuries, with no one being able to understand what it was that made them disappear. The story was adapted into the movie The Eagle, though we still don't know what really went on. Made up of 5400, they seemingly disappeared on their way to Caledonia, and some have theorised they got lost in the fogs above Hadrian's Wall, others have said there was a major Celtic ambush, and this mystery has fascinated people forever. Thrawn's forces of course disappeared into this other galaxy, with a legion possibly providing inspiration for what's happened here. Now Thrawn learns Anakin was Ahsoka's master, and they have lots of ties to each other. Anakin was actually the first person Thrawn came across when entering the main galaxy, and he was also the one who deduced that Vader was actually Anakin. This was because he realised his characteristics were the same, and this makes the battle slightly more personal. He knows how dangerous Anakin was though, and worries it might have rubbed off on his apprentice. Now, MT picked up the line that this comes from the Inquisitorial database, and many Inquisitors were former Jedi, so they had lots of information about the former Jedi Order. Now, I never really clocked it until thinking about the colours used in the episode, but I think Ahsoka becoming Ahsoka the White actually makes her somewhat a reflection of Thrawn. Her journey, of course, was based on Gandalf's journey in Lord of the Rings, but we now have these two sides where both their leaders are draped in white. Just realised that when I thought about how striking Thrawn's uniform was, and I think it really works on a more elevated level. Either way, we close out with her hiding in the bones of a dead star whale, which kind of continues the theme of life and death that Anakin underscored in episode 5. MT did a big breakdown about all the connections between this and her tale of the Jedi origin story, which itself was titled Life and Death. We're doing a big Deadpool at the moment, and I, though I really hope Ahsoka makes it out alive, her death would make a lot of sense fitting in with the themes of the season. Now we cut to a Noddy herd, and big shout out to Tom on the mic from Twitter for pointing out that Noddy actually resemble the Chelidae from Star Wars Resistance. These came from the planet Castellon, and much like the Noddy, they were an amphibious species that tended to live above water. I think like the Howlers, that they probably inspired them in the same way that the wolves are possibly precursors to the Loth wolves. Due to Peridia being where the Night Sisters originated from, they might have travelled out into the galaxy and have taken some subspecies with them that then evolved into the others. Also, it makes me wonder if, if the clothes are just stuck onto the shelves or if they take the shelves off like a backpack, get dressed and then put the shelves back on. Now, speaking of clothes, gotta be honest mate, I bloody love getting naughty and we've even made a naughty inspired t-shirt just below the video. Your chumps wanna look good, yeah? Your chumps wanna get naughty? Well, let's get naughty with a bloody naughty little t-shirt. Goes such a long way to helping support the channel, and as a thank you, yeah, you get this cool merch out of it. 
We've also got our Ahsoka and Grogu t-shirt, Theory Time one, and a lot more, and they're just right below the video if you want to get one for yourself, or, or a mate that you want to make look stupid, because you, you will look stupid wearing that. Now Sabine starts to fill Ezra in on the Emperor, and he asks if he died. She says that's what people say, which might be, might be a little joke on how somehow Palpatine returned. However, it may be her tapping into the Force slightly to sense that he is still out there. You also get the young child Noddy from last week, and this waves to Sabine. Look how cute he is. Now, it's said that Zeb's training recruits, and we of course saw him as a pilot in Mando Season 3. You also get a better look at Ezra's scars, and this highlights the conflict that the character's been through. Now, Sabine talks about the training, but the good times are broken up by Balin and Shin arriving on Howlers. Shin has a white one, with Balin having a black one, and this likely represents the Norse myth wolves of darkness and light. A huge shout out to Aaron S. Bailey on Twitter for pointing out the similarities between Shin and Joan of Arc. Looking at them side by side, I think you can definitely see how they line up, and it was a comparison that I hadn't seen brought up before. Now, the belts also tie in with their namesakes, and both their surnames are nod to Hadian's skull from Norse mythology. One of these wolves chased the sun, whilst the other chased the moon, and on each character's belt, we can either see a sun or moon symbol. Now this whole scene is kind of like the wargs from Lord of the Rings with it devolving into a big chase scene. They end up circling the wagons and this is an old west technique to close people in. Elsewhere Thrawn uses the Night Sisters to locate Ahsoka and I love how when Ahsoka says I see her, they see where she is. They literally triangulate her position using the balls again from last week which are slowly becoming their sorts of weapons. All three have to be in tune to use this, and it's kind of like how the Sisters of Fate used to pass around and share an eyeball. Also, yeah, I think that might be space plankton feeding on the space whales. You can you can see a bit of space plankton there. The ability to see is symbolised in Ahsoka with her reaching out directly to Zabine through using the Force. This is similar to how Luke reached out to Leia at the end of Empire, but unfortunately it confirms her location and Enoch's order to fire. Back with the herd we see as they spot Balin and Shin with the former ordering his Padawan to kill them. He clearly has a different path he has to follow and he points her in the direction of the Empire so she can go off on her own. A huge shout out to Star Wars Only on Twitter for pointing out that earlier in the season when Balin placed the star map in place you could actually see Orobesh writing on his wrist. This is the main language in Star Wars and when translated it actually has some names on it. These are Luke, Leia, Han, Chewie, R2-D2, C-3PO, and lastly Ben. Man's clearly a fan of the original trilogy, and hey, I don't bloody blame him. Now over the week, there's been lots of theories about who Balin's really reaching out to, and what the power is that's calling directly to him. Josh at Den of Nerds did a big video talking about how this could be Abeloth, who was a big bad in the Legends series, Fate of the Jedi. She's also part of the ones that appeared in the Clone Wars and was known as being the bringer of chaos. MT also did a big breakdown on the channel about how Peridia links to Zepho in which he goes over all the connections and things you might have missed. And this force attuned race had several tombs spread throughout the galaxy that Eno Cordova was investigating in the Fallen Order series. Filled with astriums, these are similar to the star map and this of course led the way directly to Peridia. Now in the game, Cal Kestis found a tomb dedicated to the Zephonian Kujet, and this was located on the planet Dathomir. This is the same planet the Night Sisters took over after venturing out from their home galaxy here. Now it turned out that the Zephonians had actually abandoned it, and this is when the Night Sisters took over. MT pointed out the Zephyr runes and symbols, which could still be seen on Peridia, and these highlighted that the Night Sisters were deeply linked with them. Zepho also had symbols of their head appearing above the door to the world between worlds, so there's definitely the connection here when you look deep enough. Zepho lost their way and descended to the dark side with Kujet wiping out his own people before venturing out to places unknown in order to get a fresh start. This power could be what Balin's tapping into, as I do kind of feel he's trying to restart the Jedi Order, or rather something better than it. You, I trained to be something more. This comment makes me think Balin's sick of the constant cycle that he talked about and thus he wants to restart things away from the situations that cause the rise and fall. The dark and light side of the force are constantly at war with one another with both of them going in and out of balance. When discussing Shin and Balin, Dave Filoni said their lightsabers were a major clue to their intentions and them being orange is neither a Sith nor a Jedi colour. It's not the red that the Sith wield but it's not the lighter colour that the Jedi tend to use. Instead, I think he's creating an order that taps into both the dark and light and finally ends the struggle between the two sides. 
He force chokes like a Sith, but also sticks to his word and has Shin rocking a little Padawan braid. Let me know your thoughts below, but that's just me going off on a big few time, few time, few time shirts and shit available. But let me know below if you think Balin's doing something between the two, baby. Anyway, Balin tells Shin that the impatience for victory will guarantee defeat. This sort of mirrors the lessons that Obi-Wan tried to teach Anakin as his impatience led to the loss of his limbs. The Howlers are sent in and the chase really picks up with Sabine busting out her dual blasters. These are known as West Star 35s with them possessing a rapid fire burst mode. Always thought they might incorporate them into Ahsoka having two lightsabers but either way we have these two characters that like to do a dual wield. Also I love how the naughty cars look like shells themselves adding to the turtle slash hermit crab design that they all carry. Now obviously there's a lot of similarities to the Ewoks with the scene last week being based around when Leia met Wicket. The Ewoks had primitive weapons too which we see the Noddy also using in the form of a slingshot. This primitive idea was something Return of the Jedi used thematically and it gave the idea of how to conquer power. And I think they're in there to really show that you don't need technology, you need the will and the belief to, to, to take you through anything. Uh, and the fact that you know the Ewoks were able to defeat the Empire only using ropes and rocks. I think that said something about them as a race of creatures. Fight is coming in. Doesn't matter how much machinery you have. If the will of the people is strong, they will always win. You failed, Your Highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Now Ezra has a slingshot in Rebels 2, so who knows, this might even be his. Elsewhere we see is the night troopers load onto their ships, and these are called lats which are capable of holding 15 troopers in a pilot. They do this completely silently, and just have something that seems slightly off about them. Now last week we talked about the rumours surrounding the stormtroopers, and this seems to have really taken off with there being lots of theory videos about them being undead warriors. According to the reports, they were resurrected by the Night Sisters, which is something the witches were able to do in both Fallen Order and the Clone Wars. In those, they conjured green mists, which resurrected the dead from pods and caused them to reanimate and then attack the protagonists. I believe this is similar to what happened with Marek, and though Marek Fisto theories hit the internet, it seems like he was more just giving us the idea that the Night Sisters could do this. Looking at the timeline, he didn't appear until after Balin and Shin rescued Morgan, and his armor showed wear and tear like the troopers have here. Now this makes me wonder if Ahsoka and the Magistrate's beef goes way back before Season 2 of The Mandalorian, as we had something similar during Tales of the Jedi. Ahsoka ended up fighting an Inquisitor in that, and upon killing them their masks deflated with some smoke coming out of it. This is a similar thing to what happened upon Marek's death, and he of course was also seemingly an Inquisitor. The Great Mothers likely brought all these troopers back from the dead and fixed their armor so that they could operate in combat. The Empire's biggest issue at the moment is that they don't really have an army as their old ways haven't worked out as long term plans. The clones provided one but they ended up getting rid of them and instead leaned towards going with conscripted soldiers. This meant the loyal followers who'd fight without questioning orders were gone and once the Republic took over again the Empire was without an army. As we know the First Order eventually comes to be formed but at the moment the Imperials haven't got any legions. I can see why Thrawn would turn to this in order to quickly bump up the numbers and we've even seen how Gideon's willing to turn to cloning again in order to achieve his goals. A huge shout out to Adat Chaff for pointing out this could be building off the back of the Death Troopers, graded by Joe Schreiber as they do kind of align with that. It really ramps up the tension for the fight and Ezra demonstrates his Jedi ideology by refusing to leave anything behind. In these battles we also see he's developed a new fighting style which is completely reliant on the force just like his blind master Kanan. Huge shout out to Tom on the mic again for pointing out that he says the force is my ally which is a quote that comes directly from Yoda. Now this force fighting it's getting a lot of backlash on Twitter but Sabine's had his lightsaber so he had to do something. This new galaxy is all about new things and Star Wars going in new directions so it does make sense they thought about this with the combat too. Also there's probably not any kyber crystals in this galaxy, hence a reliance on developing something else. I actually think that the Night Sisters are tapping into something similar to the Force, but the reason that they don't use weapons like the lightsaber is because the crystals don't exist out yet. Now the fighting style itself could be seen as something similar to Terrace Cassie, which was a martial arts style developed for fighters in the Star Wars universe. First dropped in the PlayStation fighting game that used its name in the title, 
We've seen it brought up in stuff like Solo. Force kicking was even seen in Return of the Jedi on the barge. And nope, what well, wasn't a bad stunt, mate. It wasn't. Uh, it always kills me out whenever Mark Hamill's asked on this. He always says that he was doing force kicking. Also, I don't know who said it last week, but shout out to them for noticing that the chainmail Ezra has is actually made from Stormtrooper dog tags. This highlights just how many of them are actually dead and why Thrawn ended up making the ally ship that he did. Now on the ground we see Balin and Ahsoka encountering each other once more and I love the build up to this with her seemingly returning from the dead to him. Ahsoka adopts a samurai pose and it leads to a duel whilst Shin and Ezra do some force karate. Kind of reminds me of the drunken style and yeah, let me know your thoughts below on it. Leading towards Shin, I love her cutting his hair and he's able to use the force to stop her lightsaber. Unfortunately, he's knocked back which leads to Sabine then having a rematch. Ahsoka gets bought some time by the T6 returning and Balin clearly wrestles with following her or joining what's calling him. In the end he goes towards that, making the battle below a lot easier for the allies. For a bit they do get surrounded and we even see Sabine's Howler hiding in one of the pods. Either way though, Balin has abandoned his apprentice and this may lead to her ultimately turning against him. Also we see the strategic mind of Thrawn with him very much playing out the battle like it's a game of chess. The Soka arrives to save the day and ultimately Thrawn's forces are ordered to retreat. He's very much just been sacrificing the pawns though and didn't really care about the outcome of it. He sees it as a success which is a major cope but it's given him time to transfer his cargo. If I'm stating the obvious I think these might be the bodies of his legion which the Night Sisters will resurrect and that's why they are pulled from the catacombs. It might even be dead Night Sisters and this would give him the power to cause havoc in the galaxy. Guess we'll see but dead dead dead. Everyone's dead except for Shin who almost gets taken in. Ahsoka offers to help her though and she's very much tempting Shin in the same way a Sith would tempt a Jedi to turn. Anyway we end with Sabine saying I thought you were dead and it sounds like she's been checking out one of our theories. I thought you were dead. You thought she was dead? Now the Noddy can breathe a sigh of relief and some famous last words from Ezra who thinks that he is going to be going home. We'll say mate because that's what people normally say before they die but either way that wraps up the episode. And for the next part of the video, I want to talk about the rumours around the finale. We are just one week away and you might end up spoiling the show for yourself if it turns out to be true, so turn off now if you don't want to know. I'll forgive you, yeah, I'll forgive you for quitting the video early, mate. I promise, no hard feelings, just, just do what you want. What a dickhead, man. You come on a video, heavy spoilers and you don't want stuff spoiled. Anyway, we apparently get Thrawn returning to the main galaxy during the midpoint of the entry. He ends up coming out on top and he promises that a reckoning is coming. The rumours also say that someone will either die or get stuck in the Pridian galaxy, though they don't specify exactly who this is. I actually think going forward for Filoni's trilogy we're going to see travel back and forth between the two becoming more commonplace and this could open up new technologies and ways to use the force but yeah that's the way that I think things are going to go with these galaxies. I am really excited for the finale and as someone who is pretty down on the series in those first handful of episodes, this has really won me around and I feel like it's the series that's going to help Star Wars finally evolve. It's paid a lot of tribute to the past with stuff like the Anakin episode but it's also clearly taking the franchise in a new direction which is something we haven't really had with Star Wars for a long time. Anyway let me know your thoughts on the show below, please drop a like on the video and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society then please click the join button. Get early access to videos every week, for example we, we launched the Return of the Jedi one two days early for members, yeah if you want to support the channel get to see stuff early just click the join button and it's just 99 cents a month or 99 pence if you're in the UK. Have you want something else to watch we've got that Return of the Jedi video on screen right now so definitely head over there right after this. Either way, huge thank you for sticking through the video. I've been Paul. I'll see you next time. You take care of yourself. Come back for the finale. Please come back. And yeah, see you next week. Take care. Peace.